growing concern worldwide over Chinese imperialism. This is nothing new, although the rhetoric recently is pointing towards other nations getting involved and having their concerns heard about China's growing military buildup as well as their commitment to soft power. Recent happenings in the Korean Peninsula are just part of a, a vast game played by the Chinese to insert themselves into geopolitical issues around the world. Doing so initially with soft power over the past decade and a half or more and also a military buildup that is flying under the radar in most of the press. Chinese overseas investment has skyrocketed over the last decade and the country has reached middle income status and begun to flex its muscles overseas, Africa especially being a key destination. A report last year found that China has become the biggest single investor in the continent with foreign direct investment increasing rapidly. 10 thousand independent firms there involved in all kinds of businesses. This is of no surprise to this channel as I reported on years ago that China and America were in a sort of cold war or a sort of soft power struggle in Africa uh, for the past two decades and in fact uh, what I'll show you here is that the military buildup is going to rapidly become a part of that equation. Ever since Xi Jinping removed term limits earlier this month, uh, we've seen a more imperialistic tone coming out of the Central Party in China. We know that relations with Africa are a key part of this as China wants to avoid any type of immediate military conflict in the Middle East which has been a hotbed of instability. However, African nations are very open to Chinese investment and a lot of the African leaders have come out recently and said that uh, they are accepting of the Chinese influence in their country to build infrastructure, to increase international trade, and quite possibly in the near and distant future military assistance and possibly military bases. Let's take a look at the satellite images very recently here that reveal massive show of Chinese warships 40 plus and their aircraft carrier which is now completely operational. This should come as no surprise as China wants to ramp up influence not only in the waterways close to the Chinese mainland but also in the waterways uh, around the world through India and up eventually through the Middle East to protect their oil supply. China is the number one importer of crude oil and will continue to ramp up demand for crude oil and that is part of the key geopolitical game here. Uh, this was earlier in the week. You'll see that China's warships were on display. You can see them lining up in rows 40 plus and this is a show of force throughout the uh, South China Sea and um, this uh, show of naval vessels, naval might um, has also raised concerns with some of the smaller partners within the Asian theater that have uh, been supportive of US policies in the past. Um, Vietnam, of course, Japan, several other nations raising concerns that uh, China has been doing a lot of chest thumping in the recent uh, weeks. Area claimed by China in the South China Sea, you can see that that swath is important because of the fact that it's not just for military reasons. It has a lot to do with shipping lanes and what a lot of people don't understand is that it has a lot to do with fishing because as you know Asia is a huge consumer of sea products and it's a multi-million, multi-billion dollar potential uh, to have control of all of these fisheries. And in addition, there is crude oil underneath uh, 
these waters, uh, the seabed floor in which uh, China has their eyes on. Obviously, it's easier in some cases to drill for deep uh, shore oil off the coast of these regions than it is to uh, have dealings with Middle Eastern oil producers and have military and logistics to be able to ship that oil or have it pipelined over the uh, geographical areas. So China wants to have basically a oil independence or an oil insurance where they have several different sources of oil, not just from the Middle East, but also deep sea drilling. Of course, uh, they've been doing shale oil here for years, and they'll continue to do that as well. The deployment of the warships are uh, unusual for its size and scope, uh, being that uh, they hadn't really had an organized show of naval force like this uh, in, their, in their history, in their recent history. So this uh, raises flags, but as I've said before, uh, concessions have been given to the Chinese and will continue to be given to the Chinese because they are members, of course, of the IMF. Uh, they are uh, playing game and, games and have been playing ball with the banking cartel. So I believe concessions will be given to the Chinese to be able to control this area. A lot of the press coming out that the uh, United States is upset about their influence through South China Sea I think has a lot to do with smoke and mirrors. Um, as in the late 1800s, early 20th century, when Japan was given the status of viceroy throughout Asia, where they controlled much of the action in Asia, and this was given to them by the West, and it was a smart move for the West because it allowed them to control Asia without actually uh, investing too much time, energy, and money into the area. So if any Asian country in the past wanted to get something done or talk to the United States, they had to go through Japan. And that was a geopolitical balance at that time. I believe that China is set to be the new Japan of Asia, where uh, if anything wants to be done in Asia, they would have to go to the Chinese and negotiate with them if they are a smaller Asian player. These shipping lanes are shown here, and you can see that uh, they are vast and quite important uh, to a lot of different nations. So it takes a logistical expertise, and it takes a military to be able to police that area. Is China getting more aggressive about uh, U.S. comments and influence in Africa and other areas? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. There's a picture of uh, Xi Jinping. And what they're doing now is they're really asserting their soft power. And they're continuing to have what's called chopstick mercantilism in Africa, uh, where they are investing uh, a massive amount of money, time, and effort into the area. In my circle of friends, I know several of them that, that either are working in Africa or have worked in Africa, which just goes to show how many people are involved in the uh, African continent. Chinese officials have increasingly prioritized visits to Africa. You can see right here the number of visits within the past decade, and there's a lot of uh, state visits to different regions of Africa because they see that as the next boom. They see Africa as untapped resources. They see Africa uh, geopolitically, militarily. They understand that there's easier inroads to Africa than there may be at some other regions in the world because they've already got a huge head start on it. Uh, there are, in fact, as I'll show you, around the world as many as 60 million different uh, people that have some kind of connection either directly or indirectly to China and uh, allowing China to really have more influence over the press and be able to get their rhetoric across and be able to combat some of the negative press that they've been getting, not just in the United States, but in other countries. Because once they play that game of controlling the press and being able to spin the rhetoric, that would help them 
increase their influence and have uh, nations around the world be more comfortable doing business with China, getting the yuan to be more internationally accepted, perhaps military partnerships, selling military hardware and even military bases, which is a, a huge concern to the current power structure around the world. Uh, picture here, here, what's China doing in the Indian Ocean? Well, they're escorting a lot of tankers and a lot of shipping lines through the Indian Ocean as well as South China Sea. Um, the People's Liberation Army Navy is a major source of spending right now and in the past decade and a half in China. You'll see more aircraft carriers. You'll see more visits by aircraft carriers, not just in Asia, but around the world. And it'll be interesting to find out how the United States and other countries deal with that sort of presence. The craziness of China's island claims, uh, they continue to insist that uh, most of these islands throughout South China Sea, uh, even the Paracel Islands that are really close to Philippines are in fact property of China. They'll bring out old maps, they'll talk about uh, old uh, writings from centuries ago that show that China owns these areas. Of course, they fail to mention sometimes that uh, the agreements after World War II that uh, China was in acceptance of are being completely ignored. You can see here that these hotspots are shipping lanes, fishing, and uh, perhaps oil producing areas that um, China's railing on, continuing to rail on for at least the past 10 years. The West goes weary of China's influence, and that uh, is shown, of course, by not only uh, university professors around the world, but also military high brass and politicians on Capitol Hill. In just the past two weeks, the intelligence services of Germany and New Zealand have publicly warned that the threat of Chinese espionage and influence operations in their countries is rising. In Washington, last Wednesday, U.S. Congress held a hearing to discuss a long arm of China, the long arm of China, into areas that uh, they feel threatened with. The United Front Work Department is an area of Chinese espionage that is influencing an estimated 60 million people around the world, whether they know it or don't know it. And that is people from mainland China that are working abroad, uh, people that are maybe Chinese-born Americans, people that are on the payroll, uh, both covertly and overtly, uh, through the Chinese government. Uh, these 60 million contacts around the world, like I've said years ago, are like sleeper cells. And some of them uh, can become loyal to China and either be double agents or flip sides. And at least in the, in the terms of uh, espionage and collecting data, China is using these contacts to be able to s continue to set up their AI. China is investing more money in AI than any other country in the world now. And this is of high concern because we know that Chinese uh, manufacturing has been a staple of the world uh, for the past 20, 30 years. And a lot of the devices that China is manufacturing has back doors implanted into them, which is prompting the Trump administration to block from selling highway phones over espionage fears. And earlier this month, Trump, Trump blocked what would be the biggest tech merger in history between Qualcomm and Singapore's Broadcom because China is investing in these companies and wanting to gain a foothold in areas around the world where they can use their AI, their backdoors in Chinese produced electronics and software to be able to uh, pinpoint uh, where the threats are within the press, uh, change the public rhetoric and also be able to broadcast and pincast information to people around the world, key players, to be able to uh, keep tabs on them and change opinions. This is a very real program. Millions and millions of dollars are, are into it. Right here you see a Chinese police officer with these new AI glasses, much like the Google Glass, where uh, this is tied into a database where they can record and they can cross-reference uh, facial recognition 
with uh, their IT systems to be able to keep track of people, to be able to identify movements, and to, like I said, increase uh, their big data presence, which initially was supplied by Western companies. It's a PDF that you need to read. It's very important. It's called The Charm Offensive. I found it to be very informative. And if you take a few minutes here to just browse through it and read, read key chapters in it, I think it will help to open your eyes on what's going on behind the scenes uh, with China, uh, their AI, big data, their soft power influence, and what's going to happen down the road with uh, hard power because you wouldn't be building a military of that size if you don't intend to either use it um, as uh, defensive or uh, offensive. And the tools that they're using um, are significant. Okay, obtaining resources, building ties to certain countries uh, that uh, do not overlap with America is now uh, what they're trying to do. Win, win friends on the other side, okay? Um, in worst case scenario, China eventually will use soft power to push countries to choose between closer ties to Washington or closer ties to Beijing. And with soft power, you can do that with the monetary influence. You can do that in a number of ways. But having the integrity, having the moral high ground is going to be key going forward. How can they villainize the West and how can they make Beijing look more benevolent and get people to jump on board to the long arm of China mentality. That's going to be key because China wants to avoid using hard power as much as possible. They're smart in that respect. They know this is a long-term game and they do not want to go to war because that uh, brings out a number of uncertainties and they understand that they're not quite ready for full-scale war in multiple theaters because their navy is just not big enough. Um, they do not have uh, the systems in place yet to be able to confidently win that type of game. So they continue with soft power, they continue to build their military, and this should be of high concern to nations around the world uh, as China wants to spread their economic and political uh, programs to uh, countries that were formerly supportive of the West.